Hello, welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari. This is Great Big History Podcast. And today we are going to talk about the solutions to settle people's early problems, especially Mesopotamia, but they're the template for the solutions that all settled people will have. So we're, t- we're talking in generic ideas um, in the macro rather than the micro and specifically to specific parts of like say Mesopotamia of Sumer and Akkad. Like they're just, they're going to use this template just like all early cell peoples. So when we left off, we had problems. We had the problems of war with nomads. Nomads will sooner or later come along looking for food and murder our farmers. And our farmers can't do anything to stop them. Two, um, we've got the problem of uh, needing um, protection from people in our society. The poor versus the poor, the rich versus the poor, the poor versus the rich, and the rich versus the super rich. Like, they all don't like each other. Now, remember, in nomadic societies, everybody got along. They might personally not like each other, but as groups, there's only one group, nomads, nomadic societies. Their problem was with other nomadic societies, not with each other, because there wasn't a lot of conflict, because they all needed each other to survive. Whereas in settled societies, you get hierarchies, you get levels of people, and those levels don't like each other. And then there's the problem of nature. How do we get nature to help us and not hurt us? So we left off asking, who are we going to call to fix this problem? Are we going to call Ghostbusters? No, we already decided. No, no, no. That's a silly thing to say, Professor. No, who are we going to call to fix this problem? Government. We are going to invent government. Now, if you're one of those libertarians who are like, government sucks. Get out of the class now because history is not the subject for you because every society has government. Nomads have government. We talked about it. And you don't get civilization without government. You may say, oh, I'm just going to be a farmer. I'm going to work. I'm not going to pay any taxes. I'm going to be fine. Yeah, what happens? Nomads come along, say, thank you for not defending yourself, kill you, Kidnap your wife, marry her off to one of their homeboys, enslave your kid, and take all your food. Thank you. Thanks. That was easy. And what are you going to do to protect yourself? I'm going to have this gun. You don't have a gun because you didn't invent civilization that created the metallurgy, that created the chemistry, that created the education in order to invent that gun. So you can't defend yourself. Oh, I'm going to shoot with this bow against a dude on a horse. You're going to get that one shot off. It's going to go way over his head. He's going to go, I shoot womp rats that are smaller than six meters. And he's going to shoot you in the face with his bow from about 100 yards away. Just like Luke Skywalker in New Hope. When they're like, oh my God, I'm never going to hit that. How are we going to hit the exhaust? It's only two meters big. And he's like, dude, I'm a farm boy. I shoot animals smaller than that all the time. That ain't hard. You're going to give me a giant torpedo and blasters? I'm easy. So for the nomads, shooting a six-foot-tall human, a five-foot-tall human, because they're not yet six feet tall, a five-foot-tall human standing upright? Pfft, they could do that with their eyes closed. Please. You are not... If you're one of these, I hate government people, you have no future in this class because... Because there is no future in you. Everything we do is a celebration of government. There is nothing that happens in this class without government from here on in. Really from the nomads talking about government. And that was like, dude, the first 20 minutes of the first class. Like we got warfare, then we got government. So, how do we get a government? Well, we get the super rich dudes and their rich homies. Remember that SR, the super rich? Versus the rich? Well, the super rich also have rich homies. Now, there are very few super rich. And so what they do is ally with some rich dudes because the rich dudes want to be hangers on. Like Turtle in Entourage is hanging out with Vince. Everything Turtle does is given to him. His awesome hundred... Uh, $500 shoes. He gets to live in a mansion. He's going to be a producer on music albums. Everything he gets to do is because his homeboys with the super rich dude. So it's the super rich plus the rich homies. And what you get is gang wars. Now, why? Because the super rich are so rich 
that they don't need other people. They are the original libertarians. They go, I don't need you. We have problems, sure, but I don't need your solutions. I don't have to listen to you. I have so much money, I can solve my own problems. <gasps> what if it floods? Well, I will hire 10, 1,000 people to build a moat around my land so that if it floods, my land isn't flooded. Oh, okay, you can afford that. Yes, I can easily afford that. I'm super rich. Uh, what, what about if people revolt? I will hire... A hundred mercenaries, 500 mercenaries, arm them, put them in, 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 give them spears, give them metal armor, and they will be my homeboy bodyguards. They could fight off a bunch of peasants if the peasants get angry. Oh, yeah, you could afford that. Of course I could afford that. I'm super rich. So they can use their wealth to solve problems. But some of these problems, like what do you do with the gods? What do you do with nomads are too big. Like the nomads are going to kill everybody. You ain't going to fight them. And so they have a solution. But the other super rich guys don't want to listen to them. They're like, no, man, you listen to me. I'm super rich. And they're like, no, I'm super rich. You listen to me. And so what do they do? You get into a fight. You get into a gang war. It's Tupac versus Biggie. It's Game of Thrones. It is Highlander. Why? Because there can only be one. For the society to survive, one of these super rich dudes has to win. If they don't, nothing happens, and nomads come along and murder everybody. Laugh and go away. So for you to get settled civilization, cities, success, survival, you have to have Someone win. There can be only one. And that one is the king. Is the king. We're not going to have democracy. We're not going to have communism. We're not going to all be a chief. And we're going to have a hierarchical system with one dude, one dude in charge. A king. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're like, well, what about Nefertiti in Egypt? Egypt has a pharaoh, and that's different. Pharaoh is a god king. It's different. And when we get to Egypt, we'll talk about how that's different. And so for a short time, they could have a woman kind of being in charge. It's usually the widow of a king. Um, there's a couple of them. They're very they're the famous ones. Um, it's pretty rare, but it does happen. And they're pretty good in Egyptian history. They're, they're pretty good. Um... But they're also gods. So there are female gods. And so you could have a female pharaoh in a way you couldn't have necessarily a female king, which is more of a judicial military job. But we'll talk about that. So we get a king. There has to be a king. If you do not get a king, you do not get civilization. So you get a king. You get structured government, not personal. Now, that may seem weird to you because there's only one guy. But that one guy is in charge of a structure. It doesn't really matter who that one guy is. The powers of the king are not the person's powers. They're the king's powers, just like presidents. It doesn't matter who the president is. The presidency is separate from the person. Like one day, Donald Trump will not be president. You may be happy about that or sad about that, but he doesn't take those powers with him wherever he goes. Once he leaves... He can't fly Air Force One again. That's over. And so um, that's how kings work. The king is in charge of this structure of hierarchy, of kings, of aristocrats, of nobles, of workers, of peasants. It's this hierarchical system. They will have also little contact with people, whereas the, the nomadic horse chief spent every day among his people. He didn't sit separate. He didn't eat separate. He was with them all the time. He's with his homeboys all the time. He's with the people all the time. He's with the goat herders all the time. It's a small society, and he's personally in contact with everybody. Whereas kings have very little contact with the people. They have their palace. They have their throne. They are separated from the people. 
presidents do the same thing. If you've ever gone to the White House, it's a very nice big house with a very big gate in front of it and heavily armed guards walking around that perimeter. It used to not be that way. It used to be in the 1800s. You could walk right in. People would knock on the front door and Abraham Lincoln would say, hello, why are you knocking on my door? Don't you understand? I kind of live here. And you could, Andrew Jackson opened up the doors and said, everybody come in. And then everybody realized, you people smell like pee and you're disgusting. Get out of the White House. But the idea was the White House was the people's house and it's all this democracy. And... In the end, we moved away from that. It was too unruly. Um, but early kings have very, they're super rich. They have very little contact with the people. So modern presidents are the same way. Um, it came out that Barack Obama used to read um, 10 letters a week that people would send in. People, ordinary people write to the president all the time. Most of the time, um, I don't know if they're re read or not. I would imagine most of them aren't read. Like your tweets to the president are not read. Um, emails probably aren't really read. But, you know, there are people on staff whose job, because this, all of this stuff has to go into national archives. Somebody has to read it, categorize it, put it aside for the archives. So, and Barack Obama wanted to read 10 per, I think it's per week. I don't think it's per day. Now, that's not to say that George Bush or his father or Bill Clinton didn't. I don't know. Um, but the idea was he, Barack Obama wanted, it just came out recently, he wanted to stay in touch with ordinary people. Because um, people love, uh, news people love doing this. They did this to George H.W. Bush in the early 90s uh, when he was running for re-election. And he said, how much is a gallon of milk? And he said, I don't know, $10. And they're like, $10? It's $1.75. Where, where, where do you live? What crazy person are you? You're not in touch with the people. And it's like one of those funny, uh, he's the president. He hasn't had to buy. He doesn't carry cash. He doesn't have credit cards. He doesn't, he's the president. Everything he does he's, is kind of more or less paid for. Now, not personal stuff. He wants to go, uh, but... He does, on a daily basis, the president does not carry cash. He doesn't go into a supermarket. He says, "Dude, I want a ham, and uh, I want a ham and turkey and cheese sandwich and a glass of milk on the side." Like it appears, like that's how presidents and kings work. It's not. It's just the way it is. So of course they don't know how much a gallon of milk costs. Like, but it's always used as you're not a man of the people. So Barack Obama tried to be a man of the people by reading the letters that people sent in. But he has very little contact on a daily basis with ordinary people. This is why Trump likes doing his, um, I shouldn't say that, why President Trump likes doing his rallies. You know, like, what are you campaigning for? You, you're the president. Like, you won. You don't have to do a campaign rally. But he wants to be in the crowd of people and give a speech that they cheer or they boo or they do their thing, you know, and feel that energy he want. And that's his way of being a man of the people. So different presidents do different things. Kings in early Mesopotamia and early civil societies are separate. They are not hanging out the way nomads did. All right. So problem one, you are sitting ducks versus nomads, like literally sitting there, why? Because you, you you got your farm. You can't go anywhere. If you move, you lose the land, you lose your farm. So you're, the nomads know where you are. Every year, you're there. This is um, a bug's life. This is seven samurai. Like, the locusts come back every year. Why don't the ants just move? Well, if they move, they don't have a home anymore and they won't have food. Like, that's worse than the situation of giving the locusts half their food so what do we do with the versus nomads we can't fight them we know we can't fight them so we build an army and march out to fight the nomads no if we do that we are dead they laugh at us and the last thing let me just tell you that the last thing you want in your life is to sit in the mud kneel in the mud with an arrow in your chest hearing nomadic horse guys laughing at you like that is not how you want to end your life it's just not so fighting them is out of the question 
So what is the answer? We're going to build walls. Giant walls. Why? Why walls? Because horses can't jump over walls. We're going to build walls big enough that horses can't go over them. And nomads don't get off their horses. And you're like, well, why wouldn't nomads get off their horses? Well, then they don't have the advantage of being on their horses. Then now they're just a guy. And a guy, I can stab. Like, I'm a farmer. I can stab a guy. I kill sheep and I kill goats and I kill pigs to eat them. I can kill a guy with a big sharp stick. That's easy enough. A dude on a horse, I can't fight. A dude on his ground being like, hi, I'm here. I'm, I'm really mean. That's a guy me and my homeboys can kill. So nomads don't get off their horses. So we're going to build walls and the nomads will come and they'll circle around the walls and we'll be on the outside. Of, we'll be in the inside of the walls going <laughs> with our hands on our, our noses, our fingers on our noses going, <laughs> you can't get us just like the um, French knights in the castle in uh, Monty Python and the, and the search for the Holy Grail because the nomads can't get in. They can't bust down the walls. They don't have the technology. They don't live in walls. They don't know how to build walls, which means they don't know how to tear them down. So they don't have any of the technology to tear any of this down. And they're not there to murder people. Like they will murder people. They're there for food. They need food. So if you give them food, it's kind of like the um, uh, Game of Thrones with Craston's Keep where they offer up, you know, children like the 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 white walkers don't need to kill Craston and his family why because they give them babies well if you're going to give us babies if you give us food then we don't have to murder you for food okay so the nomads ride around the circle they they yell everyone goes you can't get us the nomads steal whatever food they can get they ride off back to central asia and boom and you yeah, all right. Your your farm is destroyed. Your food is gone. Your pigs are dead. You know, have been carted off, or your sheep have been murdered and and shorn for for fleas. Um, your goats have been taken off for food and milk. And but that's okay. You could get more of them, and you're alive. Like you're not dead. If you're dead, and your kids are dead, and your wife is dead, like you can't undo that. So it's better to be alive, and have to restart, than be dead. Because Remember, there's also no heaven in this world. When you die, it's over. That's it. There's nothing. The best we got is a dark hole in the earth where you slowly fade away. Like, that's like the Greek Hades. Like, that's what we're talking about. The Greeks, the Jews, the um, uh, Babylonians, you all have the same idea. You kind of go into a sleep in which you go into, your spirit goes into a dark cave and you of darkness and you slowly fade away as people forget who you are. It's kind of how it works. So that's not happy. Like none of these people have a happy afterlife. It's the Christians who come along who create the happy afterlife. So so we're going to build walls. And what are the walls going to do? They're going to protect the most important stuff. So what's the most important stuff? The temple to the gods, temples to the gods, I should say. The priests, where the priest lives, because they have the temples. Uh, the palace, where the king lives, because the king ain't going to sacrifice himself. His house is definitely going to be inside the walls. Um, and anyone who can squeeze themselves inside, like especially workers who work for the rich people and whatnot. And so what you get is an urban, dense city. So you build the walls. You can't build the walls for all the farms. That's impossible. So what you do is you build walls that you can afford. And now... And you put your important stuff in there. And then the rest of that land is then filled in by other people. Like, look at Philadelphia. Look at, there is no farms in Philadelphia. Look at Camden. There are no farms in Camden. A city is defined by no farms being in it. You have an urban, dense city. So you have the king, the palace, his homeboys. Because if you're a homeboy of the king, you want to be near the king. The worst thing that would happen is the king goes, hey, where's my homie? He's not around? Well, I'll give the job to somebody else. I'll get a new homie. Like, so you have to be there. Uh, they are mansions, the priests, the temples, merchants who make stuff for all these rich people. Because when the king or a homie or a rich dude or a priest says, I want something, they don't want to have to go and find you. They want you there. Go down to the blacksmith, get my stuff. 
They want the blacksmith right there. They don't want to be like, well, I'll be back in three days. No. They want to be right there. Like, think of it as Amazon Prime in the ancient world. So you literally have the dude who makes stuff next door. There you go. Ease of delivery. People have always wanted fast delivery. So that, that guy needs his blacksmith, needs his forge, needs his house, needs his, his stuff. All within the walls. Farmers and their farms, they're going to be outside the walls. And so you define the city as that core, that urban core, versus the farms that are outside of those walls. The wall, inside the walls, city. Outside the walls, rural farmland. So suddenly, we get a differentiation of space we didn't have in nomadic society. Nomads don't have. They just go from place to place to place. All places are the same. Urban peoples, settled peoples, suddenly create new spaces. They create the urban city, and they create the rural countryside, the rural farmland. The advantage is that this system works. Cities mostly survive. Nomads can't destroy them. Now, we will talk later about the Huns, and we will talk about Mongols, and we'll talk about various people who figure out how to destroy. Nomads who figure out how to destroy cities, but mostly it's by hiring other urban peoples to work for them to destroy cities. So they come along and they go, I don't know how to, like the Mongols do this in northern China. They show up and they go, I don't know how to do destroy any of this. And the Chinese laugh at them. Ah, and the Mongols, Genghis Khan does something very smart. He goes, hey, any Chinese people want to be really rich? And people walk up and go, hey, uh, I do. And they're like, uh, do you have a degree in engineering? And they go, I do, actually have a degree in engineering, I can't get a job in a university. Uh, I'm working in a fish market, but I have my degree from uh, awesome university tech and uh, can't find a job. And he says, well, how about I pay you a lot of money and you figure out ways of build, destroying cities? He's like, how about you pay me a lot of money and I already know how to destroy these cities and I'll build the weapons to do it. And the Mongols say, great, here's a lot of money. Go hire some people. You keep what's ever left. And they go, great. Hey, who wants to get rich? And plenty of people say, I want to get rich. He goes, come and help me build a catapult and a trebuchet and some gunpowder cannon and stuff like that. And the Mongols don't know how to build any of this stuff. And so they hire Chinese people to destroy China, to help them destroy China. Okay. You could always find people who want to get rich and be on the winning side. Always. So cities will mostly survive because mostly nomads don't care about destroying the cities. They want the food. So the nomads take the food. They take the animals. They'll take some people to ride off. But the group survives. Cities, for the most part, survive. What's the problem? What problems do you have? How do you pay for it? So we know walls or what we need to save us from nomads. The question then becomes, how do we solve the problem of solving the problem? How do we pay for the walls? How do we get the money for the walls? How do we get the people to work on the walls? How do we build the walls? How? And this is what's called the problem of the commons. This is a concept, the problem of the commons, an economic concept. And it deals with anything that is essentially free that everybody shares, but everybody needs. Water is a great example of this. Healthcare now, education now. The question is, how do we pay for something everybody needs? And everyone is benefited from. So here's our problem. Here's our question. The walls will benefit everybody. So we need walls. Everybody agrees on this. Okay. Who's going to build a wall? Me? The king? Not a chance. Hey, super rich homies? Building a wall? Not a chance, man. I got super rich so I didn't have to work. Okay. So poor people are going to build the walls. Great. So I'm going to go to poor people and I'm going to say, build the wall. It will save us. And the poor people are going to go, uh, dude, I'm a farmer. 
I can build a wall. That ain't the problem. I can put, I can make the bricks and I could stack them on top of each other. Not a problem. I know how to do it. Technologically, we're cool. But if I spend a year building these walls, that's a year I'm not on my farm, which means my family starves. So when I finish the walls, I come home, I've missed the season to grow stuff, I starve. It doesn't help me. And the king goes, well, you'll be protected from nomads. Yeah, but that doesn't help me when I die from starvation. Even if I find enough food to live, I don't make any money that entire year, so I'm poorer for it. So great, I live, but I'm worse off. That sucks. And the king goes, well, that does suck. Because now you have no incentive to build the walls because it hurts you personally. Why would you, why would you build a wall that helps everybody but hurts you personally? No one would do that. So what the king has to do is create an incentive that will get people to work for him to build the walls. So what does that incentive have to be? It has to be more food or money than he would make if he just did the work. Because if it's the same amount, no one would do it. They'll be like, dude, that's hard work. I'll do what I'm doing. Farm work is hard work, but at least I know what I'm doing. Building walls is hard work and it's completely different work. I, I don't like to change. So the king goes, well, what if I give you a 50% bonus? So I will give you all of the food you would make on your 15 acre farm. And 50% more. So you get a year and a half worth of food. But you have to build a wall for a year. Now the guy goes, well, I could do that. That's a good idea. Uh, well, all right. If I do the work, I get 50% richer than I would be, even if it's a good year. And if it's a bad year, I'm 150% richer. Because if it's a bad year, I get nothing. Huh. And now all of a sudden, there the risk is worthwhile. But now where is that? First of all, where's that all that money coming from? Where's all that food that's going to that's going to replace what he doesn't produce and the extra food going to come from? That's taxes. The king has to be able to go to everybody else and say, "You're going to contribute whether you like it or not." That's taxes. And doesn't tax doesn't matter what it is. Money, food, barter, it doesn't matter what it is. It's a tax is you will give me something in order to redistribute it. Which is why it hurts my head that the the 2010s when people were all about Barack Obama and they're like he's going to redistribute you go on Fox News and it's he's redistributing wealth. Of course he's re redistributing wealth. It's government. That's what government does. Government takes money from me and gives it to a whole lot of other people. Defense contractors, Marines, government officials, diplomats, poor people, Eskimos. My money goes all over the effing place to help people. You are part of this. Community college is $100 per credit. Whereas Princeton is 1200 bucks a credit and a four year liberal arts school is $800 a credit. Wait, how could you get 12 times less money? Well, the main way is that that's subsidized. You can't afford me. You can't, you can't pay me. You don't have enough money to take my class on your own. You don't. Because if I was at Drexel teaching the exact same class, it's $800 a credit. If I was at Temple, it's $800 a credit. If I'm at Princeton, it's $1,200 a credit. It's $75,000 a year for the exact same class to talk about the problem of the commons. So I'm subsidized. I am cheaper for you because of taxes. Because a large chunk of my income comes from the county and the state. And I make a deal 
for what amount that is. And like everybody, I go, oh, I should get paid more and whatnot. But it is what it is. But you're not paying me. Very little of your tuition money goes to me. My income is mostly coming from the county, the state, and from other sources than your tuition for my class. Do you see how this works? This is the problem of the commons. How do we solve the problem that allows everyone to benefit from something, even if it would hurt the people who might engage in it? And so the answer is we have to pay them. And how do we pay them? We have to collect taxes from the massive amount of people. We collect a little bit of taxes from each person. We put it into a big pool and then we redistribute it to our workers to get what we want. So the question is not redistribution. The question is not, should money be paid in taxes? If you don't have taxes, you don't get walls. If you don't get walls, nomads come and murder you. Rich, poor, or you get, right? Sure, you're one of these libertarian and you get to stand there and go, I didn't pay any taxes, I'm rich. And the nomad comes and stabs you. Ah, oh, but at least I didn't pay taxes. You're dead. Who cares? The nomads are laughing at you. And you know what they did with your money? That you all saved and you didn't pay in taxes? They took it. And they threw it away because they don't need money. They don't care. And it's worth nothing because they burned your shit down. So great. You got to say, I didn't pay taxes, but you're dead. Your children are dead. Your wife is calling somebody else Big Poppy. You're done as a history. Your civilization is done. Your bloodline is done. You're gone. Forget you. So, so Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was a Republican, back when things were different, I grant you, but Oliver Wendell Holmes said, I like to pay taxes. With them, I buy civilization. If you look at the world's countries today and you look at any measure by the UN of the best places to live, they're also the highest taxed places. They're the Scandinavian countries, they're France, they're Switzerland. These are where you have your longest life expectancies. They're Japan. This is where people are the best educated. This is people where are happiest. This is people who have the most money in their pockets. And... Uh, the less, the least inequality, the less people in jail, l higher literacy, higher um, college graduation. All of these places are in the highest taxed places. America, the United States of America is ranked 30th in taxes. So all these people who have lied to you that we are so taxed. Oh, my God. I can't believe how much you're not. You come in 30th in the world. And guess where we rank in healthcare in life expectancy, in education, in literacy, about 30th. Now we have more inequality because we have more very rich and we have more very poor. So the very rich are as, as educated as anyone else in the world, but we also have the very poor. And you go to Appalachia, you go to Camden, we live in Camden, you see people who have nothing. Appalachia, those people have had nothing for 300 years. So, um, taxes by civilization. It's taxes that pay for the library and the librarians. It's taxes that pay for the streets that you drive on to your work, to your school. It's taxes that give you uh, clean water. Uh, I got into a fight on Twitter uh, with somebody at one time, and they're like... Uh, uh, you know, oh, oh, I, uh, water is awful. I can't believe you would say drink, drink tap water. I'm like, where do you live? Pay some taxes. New York water comes from reservoirs in upstate New York. They built it a hundred years ago. It's f like champagne. It is water that is so awesome. Like where, what podunk hick place do you get to walk around and say, I don't pay taxes and I can't drink water. You know what? I'll pay some taxes and drink water out of a tap. Thank you. Without getting a disease. Like, you made a choice. And you chose not to have clean drinking water so that you saved money. How does that make you smart? 
Like, that is dumb. That is a dumb choice. And anyone who would pick dirty drinking water over taxes is making a dumb choice. Because you know what most people want in the world? Most poor people want in the world? Clean drinking water. Water that you can drink from, water you can bathe in, water you can wash your clothes in. They don't want to do it in a dirty lake and a muddy river. They want to do sparkling, clean, and urban water is for the most part incredibly, where you have good taxation, clean. New York gives water to 16 million, 8 million people. There's 16 million people in greater New York, and it's awesome water. It's clean. I don't even know the last time you had, um, what's the disease with the C? The disease that's all about dirty water that's going on in Yemen right now and it happened in Haiti. Uh, cholera. Thank you. Uh, cholera. I don't know the last time New York had a cholera epidemic. Before they built the reservoirs? I don't know. I literally cannot tell you the last time that New York had a massive cholera epidemic that killed thousands or tens of thousands of people because it has clean water. Why? Because they spent the tax money to build clean water. So the solution places that do not get a king and places that the king does not get the right to control taxation do not build walls. When they don't build walls, the nomads come and kill everybody, which benefits nobody. So we are pro-taxes. We are pro-government in this class because it makes your life better. Whether you appreciate that or not, it makes your life better. I am better off with all of you people at state and community colleges being better educated, being literate, being analytical, you and having better jobs and making more money because then you will make better products that I will buy and you you will send your kids to college so that I will have more students so I will have a job so that it benefits me. I am benefited by society getting richer and smarter rather than keeping those t thousands of dollars in my pocket. That benefits me in a small way but it doesn't help protect me from terrorism. It doesn't help me protect me from ignorance. It doesn't protect me from the poor dudes who might steal, want to steal my money, like out of a Scrooge, out of Christmas Carol. Christmas Carol, he dies, and he ain't dead 10 minutes before they're stealing. The poor people are stealing. The bandits are stealing his stuff. That's the whole story. Like when he sees the third, when the Scrooge meets the third ghost and the he, the third ghost shows him what's going to happen and he's like oh who's this guy oh it's me it's this guy and they're talking about they're talking about me and the guy says oh here's his bed clothes and it's like they're still warm like he hadn't cooled off yet from his death and they broke into his rich house knowing he was a rich guy and he broke in and he stole all his stuff and that's why He's much more generous at the end because it benefits him to be more generous. It benefits the rich people to pay taxes. It benefits. Here's Donald Duck. If you're watching the video, taxes will bury the axis. The U.S. government asked Disney to make videos. And one of the ones they asked for is to remind people to pay their taxes. And Donald Duck is pissed. He's like, I'll be a soldier. I will volunteer. What do you need me to do? And America, the radio says, pay your taxes. And he's like, why? Taxes suck. And he's like, taxes will bury the axis. Taxes will pay the soldiers. Taxes will buy the planes. Taxes will make the bombs. Taxes will pay the workers who will buy your stuff. Taxes, taxes, taxes. If you don't pay your taxes, we can't win the war. The most patriotic thing you can do is pay taxes. Now, does that mean you have to like taxes? No. The debate isn't whether you pay taxes or not. And that's what I've been talking about for the last 10 minutes. 
The debate should be, what do you pay your taxes for? What do you buy? The whole part of redistributing the wealth, the whole part of paying, of gaining taxes is to buy something. Ancient civilizations built walls. We gained protection. So if you want to have a debate on what to buy with those taxes, that is a democratic debate to have. And I am all for democracy and democratic debate. But we will not have a debate in this class, in any of our classes, in society, of not paying taxes. You have to pay taxes for the society to work. You needed to do it in the ancient world. Once you settle down, you are not independent. You make money and think you're independent, but you are reliant on lots of other people. And the first thing you're relying on is not to be murdered by nomads. And so... In our next lecture, we're going to talk about the next solution to the problems. So, this is solution one, nomads, and the problem of the commons. We have talked about, just so I know it's 40 minutes, but we have talked about massive, we have invented government, we have invented defense, we have invented taxes, we have invented um, the problem of the commons, the fundamental question in all of human history of how to, what to do with wealth. Like, I hope you appreciate, I know it's been 40 minutes and you're rolling your eyes, but we have dealt with questions that are so massive, we are dealing with them now, 3,000 years later, 4,000 years later, on how to deal with this stuff. We're still deal dealing. These are the biggest questions humans deal with in society. So take care, and I'll see you in our next lecture on the next solution to problems. Thank you.